It looks good. Okay. okay, great. Now, can you see my mouse? Probably not. Can see your mouse? You, you can? Yeah, we can. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I have a pointer also. Great. So, um, yeah. Uh, good morning or good evening, uh, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the invitation, and it's a it's a great pleasure to share all of this exciting research uh, that was done by the by the people that you see in the in the photo uh, back when taking a photo like this was not extremely dangerous. So my name is Jan Pop, uh, and I will tell you today um, about fluxonium qubits um, made with granular aluminum. So we've seen uh, a lot already about, um, we've had a lot of introduction and, and even more than that uh, about the fluxonium qubit. So we all know um, it consists of uh, Jolson junction. Uh, here I included the, the capacitance, that's the box around it. Um, and we have this shunted by a superinductor. And um, the main challenge, I would say, in fabricating these devices uh, is making the superinductance. Um, you can make the superinductance with Jolson junctions, as Vladimir uh, did in Michel's lab uh, for the first time in 2009. Um, and you can um, employ even more interesting uh, arrangements, uh, not just a linear uh, array, but you can employ some uh, cells which can become highly inductive uh, at some particular flux points, as shown in this, uh, in this PRL paper. Um, last but not least, not least, I do want to point out the pioneering work done in the Delsing and Heaviland group uh, early on. So um, one, uh, one last point before I move on. Uh, it's important to remember that this superconducting loop is closed and uh, we have an in-situ flux bias, uh, which is quite nice because it, it gives us a handle to change the, um, the spectrum and, uh, and the matrix elements which means that we can change actually the susceptibility to different loss mechanisms. And that has been used by the previous speakers and it's very useful to use this as, um, uh, as a diagnostics tool to try to pin down where actually your losses are coming from. Um, basically, all of the results that I will show you today are at the half flux sweet spot. So, <laughs> yeah, Oops, I thought there was a question. <laughs> Um, so this is um, this is an Im electron beam image of uh, one of the fluxonium qubits uh, that I fabricated while I was uh, at Yale in Michel's group. Uh, you can see the scale here, five microns, and these are the other type of uh, shadow evaporated uh, junctions that uh, you may have heard of. Uh, these are the bridgeless uh, type. Um, I think there. I mean, I think that it's really a question of taste between Dolan Bridge or this type. The, the reason I like these is because uh, it allows you to remove the metal uh, in between these junctions and probably reduces a bit the capacitance to the ground. But we've seen that there are more spectacular ways, uh, right, in Vladimir's talk, there are way more spectacular ways of, uh, of removing this, uh, this capacitance. So, <laughs> so if we go through this design, um, the face slip junction is right here. This is the tiny junction. This is the one that gives them uh, the qubits uh, nonlinearity, and then all the other lines that you see are junctions, and they form this uh, this superinductor. And it's versatile in the sense that we can also uh, split some of these junctions, like here, to have uh, squids, which make a tunable coupling to our antenna, which is our readout cavity. Which we, um, in this case, actually we put in one of those um, um, cavities that uh, Han He introduced in 2011. Uh, but in the rest of the talk, that uh, in, for the rest of the results that I will show you, we put these antennas in um, copper waveguides, uh, similar to the ones that uh, Vladimir showed. Right, so uh, the whole point of my talk is to show you how we can go away from this long array of junctions. Uh, and I do like the junctions. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of junction arrays. And in the end, we are... This, the, um, the solution that I will show you to go away from the junctions, it's still, it's still a very long junction array. It's just that um, um, we don't have to pattern it necessarily. It kind of self-assembles. So uh, there has been quite some um, excitement in the, in the community and quite some nice results uh, in the last few years on, um, as Oleg was also mentioning, on implementing 
um, high kinetic inductance um, uh, materials uh, in, in, in quantum circuits. So um, all, all these titanium, niobium, nitrides, uh, these are all very, very nice uh, materials. What I will tell you about today is uh, granular aluminum. Uh, and it's the most of the results uh, regarding the fluxonium qubit uh, are in are in this are in this uh, summarized in these three papers. And I do want to to say that um, I, I fully agree with uh, Dave uh, with Dave Schuster's uh, optimism and uh, sentiment that uh, in trying to improve something in the fluxonium, sometimes you can have very nice surprises. And you, you will see a small example of that in this case also. Trying to improve this superinductor uh, by going to a disordered um, uh, superconducting film, we actually had some quite some nice uh, surprises. So uh, since this is the first time, I think, uh, today that this is uh, really uh, mentioned, I, I just want to uh, uh, do a brief introduction of, um, to granular aluminum as a material. It's actually a... a um, its name, it's very descriptive. So it, it consists of um, aluminum grains, uh, which are pure aluminum grains. You can, uh, you, you can uh, see really like um, a perfect, uh, perfect tiny little, you can see them as perfect tiny little crystals uh, surrounded by a very amorphous um, aluminum uh, oxide uh, matrix, which is also non-stoichiometric. So this is, you can see this kind of like a, a goo from a crystallographic point of view. So immediately when you look at this, uh, you might be uh, suspicious and you might, uh, you might think that this is not such a good idea because we are surrounding these perfect crystals with, um, uh, with a glassy material. Right? So this material has been known since the 60s, uh, actually, and uh, people have had like a steady interest in it. I, I, will not go, uh, I will not go through the details, but basically um, these grains very early on have been demonstrated to be uh, rather um, uh, uniform, um, depending on the temperature of the substrate during the position, they are in the range of a few nanometers, um, plus minus one nanometer, so really quite 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 nice, uh, nicely self-assembled in a way. Um, and uh, what fascinated people at the beginning about this material was the increased TC. So actually, you know, compared to the 1.2 Kelvin of aluminum, you can go up to three Kelvin or even four Kelvin if you deposit this on a um, on a liquid helium uh, called, called uh, cooled substrate. Um, and then there has been a steady interest of, uh, um, for this material over the, until now, I would say, uh, from a fundamental point of view, it was a model system for the superconducting to insulating transition. And it's also a material robust in magnetic fields. It has a critical field in the range of like five, six, uh, five, six steps. Now, um, my interest is from the device and circuit community, right? So I want to, before I start using these, uh, I, I, I would like to know uh, some basic microwave uh, phenomena, um, well, properties. So I would like to know if I make um, uh, an object uh, such as this one, which you can see it as a strip line resonator if you want, with a large aspect ratio, so a large ratio between the length, uh, the width, and, and the thickness, the thickness is typically 20 nanometers. The length is typically, let's say, millimeter or less. Um, and the width is some tens of, uh, of microns. So if I have such an object, the question is, what will be its uh, dispersion relation, right? So it will have some higher harmonics. And it would be nice to know where, uh, where those harmonics are. As, as Vladimir showed, uh, you, know, you, you do want to know what happens to, uh, in, the, in the higher end of your, uh, of, of your um, uh, superinductor spectrum. Um, and um, secondly, you want to know what the, at least to a first approximation, what are the nonlinear terms, right? Uh, what is the self curve and the cross curve coefficient? So, um, a, a very crude model that we <laughs> employed to start thinking about this material uh, is just a linear Johnson junction array, which uh, you can justify it in the limit of low frequencies due to these large aspect ratios here, uh, then you can imagine that the curve, that transport is in, in one dimension. And then you can have a model where you have islands uh, connected to the ground, right, with some uh, capacitance. And then each island is, con is connected to, to, to the neighbors for a Johnson junction, which itself has uh, a self-capacitance. Now, 
I won't go through the details because we can actually learn a lot from just studying the Joseon Junction Array um, uh, results in the, in the Junction Array community. But these are just a few examples here. Uh, but the, the dispersion relation will be um, linear at the beginning, and then it will saturate to some plasma frequency. And just to give you some idea uh, for our films, the plasma frequency uh, is somewhere in the range of 100 gigahertz. Uh, and maybe a bit below, um, but uh, you know it's it's way above the typical 20, 30 gigahertz that you, that at least I employed for the super in, for the junction array mesoscopic junction array superinductors. So that's nice. We can push this plasma frequency higher, and maybe that will help in some in some respect. Um, and then the uh, the next question is the nonlinearity, right? So um, I, again, I'm skipping the calculations, but in a way, you can translate the results from the junctionary community into material parameters, into this formula. So the self care coefficient, which to some, which is very related to the cross care also, so it gives the right, the same scaling. So the self care coefficient will have some, um, some uh, prefactor here, which is not that important. Then it will contain A is the grain size. So this, this is going to be the three or four nanometers of your grains, depending on how, how you deposit the films. And then uh, the, the self care coefficient will be inversely proportional to the critical current density, as you would expect. And it will be inversely proportional to the volume, um, to the effective volume uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, current mode, let's say, right? So this is not exactly the volume of the resonator. This is the volume that sees current. So uh, how does this compare? How does this crude model, right? This is coming from a 1D Jolson Junction Array model. How does this compare to reality? So what we, what we are showing here, what we've done in this paper is to, to do a survey over um, several different samples with several different um, uh, resistivities, which translate into different critical current uh, densities and quite a wide range of um, volumes for, for, uh, for the, uh, mode. Um, while the frequency is more or less constant, this is given by, of course, as you all know, by the uh, instrumentation. So on this axis, we plot uh, uh, the, the term, the frequency divided by critical current and voltage term, and on the other axis, the, the, the actually measured self curve. And uh, the black line is actually a calculation. So there's no, there's no free parameter in the black line. Um, we've uh, put, I think we've used four or five for the uh, for the size of the grain, nanometers. Uh, and, and the points on the log scale, right, <laughs> with quite some scattering, um, they, they do follow this trend, which is nice. I think, um, I wouldn't say this is really a quantitative model, but it does give you a quite good idea of what to expect uh, in, in which range. Right? Excuse me. <laughs> yes? I have a question here. What sure. is, how do you determine the volume of the granular aluminum? Is that measured? Or is it determined oh, in some way? Um, in a way, if you want, it's the participation ratio uh, of, of the granular aluminum that sees current, that actually sees electrical current. So if you, if you just think about, um, imagine you would have a constriction in the middle, and then you have some big granular aluminum pads, which are just capacitors. Of course, you should not count that volume, but you should count the volume that actually sees current. So it's a weighted average, if you want, of the um, of the volume that sees current. Okay, I don't understand. But let's go on. Um, okay, how, how how can I formulate that easier? So um, I, I want to. He's asking. What measurement he's asking how you determine it. Is volume of the granular aluminum something you measure, or uh, is well, that for, so for a, yeah for for a strip line resonator, basically within a factor of two, it's the volume of the strip line resonator. Okay, thank you. Right, it's the volume of the material that actually sees uh, current uh, and for and a and particular the, Okay, so that's actually the volume of the thing uh, that you measure and determine. And then the A parameter is some kind of size of the granules, which yes, you exactly. assume. Uh, could you repeat that? I, it cut off. A, the factor A is the, the size of the, the granules, which you assume. 
Uh, well, actually, we don't have to assume it. It was measured early on in the 70s. It was measured, uh, I think, to the work of Die Deutscher, and it's in the range of uh, three to four nanometers, depending on how you deposit the field. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So please don't hesitate to interrupt. It helps to calibrate the speed of the talk. Yeah. Right. So um, the the different colored points here actually correspond to different, let's say, um, nonlinearity regimes, which give you an idea of what devices you would use this material for. Right. So in blue, um, th this is a very low self care regime, which is where you want to be with superinductors and also with kinetic inductance detectors, right? So in this regime, in a collaborative work uh, with, um, with the Mika team in, uh, in the Institute Nell in Grenoble, we've actually made some kinetic inductance detectors, which are quite interesting um, out, of, uh, out of this material with very high kinetic, um, with very high kinetic inductance fraction because you know, this material can have like an easily nano Henry's per square uh, kinetic inductance. Now, in the intermediate regime, this is the regime of uh, up to kilohertz um, uh, self care. Uh, this is where you you would want to use. Um, this is the nonlinearity that you would like to have for parametrically pumped devices, right? So, if you want to build an amplifier, for instance, uh, this is where you would want to be. And um, to give you an idea, um, well, I'm I'm featuring here some some data measured with a different type of amplifier with an amplifier with actual Josen junction arrays that we made in our lab, um, we, which we nicknamed uh, dimer Josen junction array amplifier. Uh, but since the model that we show here for granular aluminum, it's exactly a junct junction array model, right? Um, we are pretty confident that we can apply basically the same design strategy and build very high dynamic range parametric amplifiers uh, using this material. Uh, and yes, I do want to point out that uh, this work was done in collaboration with the group of Nicola Rock uh, in, uh, in Grenoble. And finally, the, you know, the last type of devices um, is uh, if you can push the nonlinearity high enough, uh, you might be able to get qubits, right? So basically, you're going to get a, some kind of a transmon qubit where except you, you don't have one junction, but you have some array of junctions, right? And indeed, we've uh, made a device where we tried to minimize the volume, right? And we tried to, um, uh, to decrease the critical current to some degree. And we could measure a, a qubit with an anharmonicity of about 5 megahertz. And here you can see the, the, the dependence of the Rabi oscillations. So this is how the device looks like, right? It's a bridge um, of granular aluminum shown in blue. And it's connected, everything else in red, uh, is aluminum, right? Because we want to uh, we want to have some large capacitor, um, and uh, we we see we measure Q1s in the range of three microseconds, and we understand this is this is clearly per cell limited. It comes from from the way we measure this. Um, so the intrinsic Q1 is somewhere in the range of uh, 20 microseconds, um, and we see encouraging. Uh, let's say it like this: we see encouraging. Um, uh, coherence times. Uh, so um, this is the Ramsey and uh, this is the this is the one echoed one one echoed uh, T2. Yeah. So and uh, yeah and I think the Ramsey was measured actually over like a long time because the, our measurement uh, uh, contrast was not was not very high. Yeah. So this is I think some something like uh, 20 or 15 minutes. Yeah so what is it yeah. what is this gray material? Gray color material. Ah, gray that? color. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Sorry, I should have mentioned it. So everything that you see here, all the all the um, uh, um, uh, texture that you see, actually, it's not real. It's just gold that we use for imaging. So that's all given by the gold. That's not how the films actually look like. So the gray uh, background is a sapphire substrate covered by uh, gold for imaging. Thanks. All right. So yeah, but this is uh, in a way um, this concludes my introduction to this uh, to this material. Uh, I just wanted to show you some uh, some um, uh, data which which shows the versatility, right? You can go from very low nonlinearity to very high nonlinearity, and despite the fact that you have all of this amorphous um, oxide, this ALOX in between the pure grains, uh, granular aluminum seems to not couple too much to to these defects to which presumably still are in, in this amorphous uh, glassy system. 
Um, and moreover, we could we could tune the frequency of this uh, uh, of this qubit with uh, in-plane field. So we could tune it over some one or two hundred uh, megahertz, and we didn't see any anti-crossings. So that was quite interesting. Uh, our line width is twenty kilohertz. We didn't see anti-crossings, but but it's true that we didn't go that far. We only swept the frequency over uh, two hundred megahertz. So I, I would mention that as a preliminary. Uh, optimistic, let's say, uh, observation. Yes, was there another question? No, okay, good. So, well, uh, if possible, I would, uh, if possible, I would make uh, maybe a brief comment. Sure. Uh, the, I see the problem with the model which you present, the model of uh, Josephson junction arrays, because uh, it seems to me this model assumes that each grain is a superconductor mm, what well, some degree yes i mean you you are you, you don't need to assume that each of them is a superconductor you need enough of them to be superconducting to to be able to have uh, transport well but at least uh, individual grains of this size are not superconducting they are too small um well i, I think yes yeah, so i think this is <laughs> This is the, the fascinating part of granular aluminum, which kept people uh, working for the last 50 years, um, which is to, you know, to, to understand uh, microscopically the mechanisms of superconductivity. Uh, and I, I think it's still not really clear what actually happens, or at least not to me, right? I mean, it's not really clear why, why the TC is actually increased by, by a factor of two or by a factor of three, actually, even uh, as you make these grains smaller. So the difference between cold deposition and warm deposition, uh, room temperature deposition, let's say, um, is that when you deposit cold, the grains become smaller and TC goes up. So yeah, to me, that is positive, I agree. Uh, well, uh, just to, uh, to fix the point, uh, they are so small that uh, levels, um, single, uh, particle level sp uh, spacing is uh, several times larger than the gap. That is so, true. So yeah. they, they cannot be superconducting individually. They can be yeah. superconducting only as a whole system. And this is why the Josephson yeah. Junction uh, model is not quite applicable. This is just what I wanted to say. Well, no, I, so, uh, yeah, whether a single junction or a single you know, like three nanometer grain on its own, whether it is superconducting. I think it's a it's an interesting thought experiment to, to think about. But uh, uh, the, clearly, there is a collective uh, there is a collective behavior here because we have billions of these grains uh, coupled to, it, to each other through the through the LO, uh, LOX uh, through the through the amorphous oxide, right? So uh, if if you don't have tunneling. Um, this this object is insulating. It goes through an insulating transition. That yeah, that's clear. Yeah. Uh, I and I agree with you. This model is very very crude. Um, we at least I like it because it gives us some uh, predictive power for the um, for the dispersion dispersion relation, which you can. I'm not talking about it here. You can see it in this paper. And for the nonlinearity, and you know, to some degree, as an experimentalist, uh, that's um, that's nice. It's it's nice to have at least a good guess of what is happening. Uh, yeah, if, if our guess comes from a completely wrong model, of course, I I, I would be very happy to to learn about that. Good. So yeah, so I've talked about these uh, these regimes. Um, yeah, so can we make a fluxonium uh, with this uh, granular aluminum superinductor? So uh, this is an optical image here, just as a reminder of how the fluxonium looked like. You saw an electron beam image before. Um, and um, you can see here in this optical image, you can actually see also the, the two millimeter antenna that, that we used to couple to. So now um, we tried to, to, to do a one-to-one correspondence between this uh, this previous sample from 2014 and the uh, the granular aluminum fluxonium so you can see again here um, an antenna which is about um, some two millimeters long maybe a bit less 
Um, then if we zoom in into the center, uh, you can see already there is quite a difference because this loop uh, is just a simple loop with some wires. And if I zoom in, uh, you can see now that uh, some of these wires are colored in red, and those are the pure granular aluminum uh, wires. And the wires which are colored in magenta, those are um, a double layer. Basically, it's granular aluminum shunted by aluminum. So transport will presumably go through the aluminum layer, which is much, much lower impedance. And the blue parts are pure aluminum. So the junction itself remains a pure aluminum junction. And this is important to remember because the gap here will be uh, smaller. Right? So we'll have the red parts will have a gap of 2 Kelvin, and the blue parts will have a gap of uh, 1.4, 1.5 Kelvin. So this is effectively, it's not great, but this is a quasi-particle trap uh, that, that, that we have. So yeah, uh, it's in a, in a way there is there is some beauty to this to this picture, but it's also when you try to impress people with uh, with you know nice pictures of deep fabricated devices, uh, this picture with the junction is much more impressive, right? It, it looks much more uh, involved. Here, all, in a way, the beauty of this picture is that um, all the power comes from the internal dynamics of these of these red wires. Good, so how does it perform? Uh, so this is a T1 relaxation. This is a typical, I would say, T1 that uh, we can measure at, uh, at, at half flux. Uh, we see some tens of microseconds of T1 relaxation. Um, you can see here that uh, there, there are some fluctuations. Uh, and uh, you can see that we can do a single qubit uh, gate, so a pipe pulse, um, in about 10, 10 nanoseconds. Um, and I think we, we can go faster, but to do that, Basically, we'd have to push the Rabi frequency close to the qubit frequency, and then we would have to deal with all these uh, uh, non-RWA um, terms. And um, well, thanks to the work of in the group of David Vincenzo, we think that it's possible to deal with all of that. Um, we just have to figure out uh, technologically how what electronics we need to, to do that uh, in an efficient way. Um, and the coherence time. So this is a this is a T2 uh, measurement without any uh, without any uh, echo, uh, and this this is also without uh, without uh, uh, echo. And uh, if we echo, we get something very close to to to, to T1. So it it seems like uh, this qubit uh, is not world uh, world record breaking, but it is it has a very decent uh, very decent and promising uh, coherence. So uh, here's one of the nice uh, surprises that I was telling you about. So as we were measuring this, uh, this qubit, we realized that we can increase the readout photon number in, in, the, in the antenna, and nothing bad happens. Uh, actually, we realized that we could increase it so, so much. You know, notice here, it's, uh, we have a circulating photon number of 124 photons. And uh, we can clearly see quantum jumps of the Fuchsonium qubit. And this data is taken without a parametric amplifier. So this is just. Uh, the the hemp the, the data taken with uh, with a two Kelvin hem, um, and you can see that uh, the qubit doesn't uh, leak too much at least well, not from this data uh, to higher states, and uh, it doesn't seem to be very much affected uh, by this uh, photon number, which was not the case in at least in the previous Fuchsonium qubits that I was uh, uh, used to and that I measured where even one or two photons could actually uh, increase by orders of magnitude the relaxation rate, gamma down. We actually use this to reset the qubit. So it was convenient to just drive the qubit, drive the resonator to reset the qubit. So um, we can do a more uh, quantitative analysis of these quantum jump traces. And what you see here is the transition rates, right? The gamma down and gamma up from quantum jumps. Uh, we have the decay during uh, during readout. So this is with the readout pulse on. Um, and then we have the free decay. So this is without, uh, with, uh, without photons in the resonator. And uh, you can see that um, overall, I mean, there, there's not a clear trend. This is kind of overall flat. But we do have some peaks here, which are somehow reminiscent of uh, what the, um, the, the Google group actually reported in 2016. We, we do not, we currently do not, do not explain these peaks. Uh, maybe it is actually some resonances with some higher levels. Uh, we have to look into this uh, in, into more detail. 
But the, the nice feature is that uh, we can go up to 200 photons and nothing dramatic changes, in, in, I would say, in this picture. And if we look at the temperature of the qubit, we see that we start from an effective temperature of 29 millikelvin, very close to the 31 millikelvin of the fridge. And then actually, this, this temperature, the temperature is constant here, but the population that you would expect for the qubit changes because of the AC start shift, the actual frequency of the qubit changes. And that's why this is a bent, uh, bent line. All right, so I think I have uh, five more minutes, so I should speed up a bit. Uh, so we can, again, this is data without a parametric amplifier. We can, um, uh, we can measure very nice um, uh, blobs in the IQ plane corresponding to the two states, right? So this is the ground state. This is the excited state. This is uh, measured at 98 circulating photons. Um, and we can use some fast electronics, like some fast FPGA card, to reset the ground state um, or reset to the, excited, to the excited state. And when we reset to the excited state, we can actually see that there is a little bit of extra population here, which corresponds to about 1% in the X state. And uh, okay, so all of this data is taken with a measurement pulse of 500, about 500 nanoseconds. Now, this is not to say that we don't need parametric amplifiers <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Uh, this is just to say that um, the qubit is uh, somehow surprisingly resilient to, to read out photons. And if you add a parametric amplifier, which is also resilient uh, to photons, basically a high dynamic range parametric amplifier, everything gets better, right? Then you can actually see much more. So this is the, the same qubit measured with one of these double Johnson junction array amplifiers. Um, and now, you, so the integration time is 16 nanoseconds here. And it's much shorter than the, than the resonator response time. So actually, the points that you see in between the blobs here, in between G and E, these are not averaging. Uh, these are not coming from averaging a qubit uh, quantum jump. But these are just the response time, the classical trajectories corresponding to quantum jumps. And we can actually calculate them. So you have, you have an example here of, the, of two, two such trajectories. So yeah, we, this, we find this very nice. Um, and we don't really have a good explanation why uh, why the qubit is so resilient uh, to read out photons. Um, I'm I'm happy to to hear suggestions and uh, yeah I'm, I would be very happy if we could come back to this in the discussions. So um, maybe in the last few minutes a, a few words about the coherence sources. So in in this paper right here we've actually shown that. The dielectric loss tangent at the surface of granular aluminum is very comparable to, um, let's say, to, to pure aluminum, although pure aluminum also gets oxidized uh, at the surface. Um, so, um, but, but our quality factors are slightly below that. So uh, what, what, uh, what pushes the quality factors uh, lower? Well, we believe it's quasi-particles. In, and in particular, in this material, quasi-particles can live for a very long time. And you can see here a plot of the um, uh, response of one of these uh, granular aluminum strip line resonators uh, in the absence of any excitation. And you can see, so this is time versus time. So this is like a wrapped, if you want, wrapped very long time plot. And if we look at just one of these events, um, you can see that uh, it corresponds to a rather large phase shift uh, of, well, on the order of kappa, uh, followed by a relaxation time of seconds. So um, the fact that quasi-particles live so long, for such a long time in this uh, disordered superconductor uh, can definitely account for the fact that we see more quasi-particles in this material than in pure reactants. <coughs> but it, it is also a very nice diagnostics tool because you can, you can see all of these effects with a huge contrast. So these, uh, by the way, in the kinetic inductance community, these, these kind of impacts have, are well known and uh, people associate them with um, an energy release in the substrate, uh, which um, can give up to one keV of energy released in the device itself. So in the substrate, this energy is orders of magnitude uh, larger. So the the not the, the the let's say worse news <laughs> is uh, is that these these impacts that uh, we are reporting here they are also correlated in time. So if we look at uh, pairs of resonators, for, for instance, resonator A and resonator B or resonator A, resonator C, um, these frequency shifts uh, occur in the same time, 
uh, quite often. Very rarely we see a frequency shifting on, on only one axis. So you can, you can read about it in this recent paper. And it's, uh, it points to a, to a source of uh, the coherence, which was also um, pointed out by the um, MIT group, which is uh, radioactivity, right? I mean, these, these energy releases in the substrate uh, are very likely coming from some uh, ionizing interactions in the substrate. So can we do anything about them? So, of course, since I'm asking this question, probably, yes, we can do. So there are two things that we have tried so far. So one thing that we've tried is to actually fight this, these effects on chip. So if we know that these are coming from phonons, then if we put phonon traps, right, if we put some material with a lower gap uh, in this region, so it's just a these are just a bunch of islands, many, many, many islands of aluminum, which has a lower gap compared to granular aluminum. These are, our, these are the strip line resonators that we're looking at. So uh, you can see them here. So if we put some lower gapped material next to our higher gap granular aluminum, um, Cooper pair breaking phonons will be down converted and trapped to frequencies below the gap of the, the aluminum. Right? So they will not, we will still have a lot of energy in the substrate, uh, in the form of non-equilibrium phonons, but they will not be able to break, uh, at least not easily, um, Cooper, pair, Cooper pairs in granular aluminum. So uh, that works quite nicely. So here we have a witness where we don't have traps, and this is the, um, this is the frequency basically, uh, just measured uh, in time, in minutes, and you can see there's some uh, low frequency, you know, like one over F noise, and then there are these impacts uh, that I've uh, highlighted before, shown by these crosses. And then we put, we cover 19% of the substrate, we cover it with, with these phonon traps, and obviously things get better, right? Even visually, if, if you look at it, and we quantify this effect, and it's, this effect is actually reliable over all the resonators that we've looked at. So another thing that we can do, uh, and this is the last, uh, the last topic I will, uh, I will talk about, is that we can actually go, as, as Will Oliver was saying, uh, we can actually go uh, underground and try to, um, to decrease the number of um, ionizing impacts uh, that, that can, can happen in the substrate. So uh, we have three types of devices here that we will all, uh, we will baptize by the, by the initial, right? K from Karlsruhe, that's where, uh, where we are uh, right now and where our lab is. R for Rome, that's where our collaborators uh, have uh, an above ground cryostat and Gran Sasso for the underground laboratory in under the mountain called Gran Sasso uh, in Italy, so, which has a very easy access. It's just a, an exit from the highway and you can access a shield of 1.4 kilometers of uh, nice low radioactivity granite. So, um, and, and there is a cryostat there, which we equipped for, for these types of measurements. So let's see, let's see what happens. So when, when we do our measurements in Karlsruhe, uh, for now, please focus only on this panel. Um, the other panels basically show the same thing. Um, so if we just sh uh, focus on this panel, uh, what you see here is the rate of these quasi-particle bursts, right? So we start from one every few seconds right here in Karlsruhe. And then we do some cleaning of the materials. Of course, I don't have time to explain it, but I'll be happy to, happy to give you more, more details later. We can do some cleaning to decrease the local radioactivity. Um, and then we measure in Rome and we see that uh, we are able to consistently reduce the, the rate of these impacts ju just by doing some radioactive purification, let's say, uh, and hygiene uh, uh, around our sample holder. Um, and then we go underground and, of course, as expected in this very pure environment, uh, we, we measure a very low rate uh, of impacts, um, basically two orders of magnitude uh, below what we measure in Karlsruhe. We can push back this rate actually quite easily. This point here, which shows an increase by a factor of two in the, um, in the burst rate, is just removing the lead shield. So the Karlsruhe had a lead shield very similar to the one that Will Oliver showed in his talk, just that we didn't have it on a, on a winch. We had to like manually remove the lead, the lead bricks. Um, and then we see a factor of two increase in the impact rate. And if we bring a thorium source, so we have a little 
very small radioactive source, you know, the, the kind that is allowed in the tunnel. Um, and then we can get actually an impact rate uh, even higher than, uh, than above ground, right here. So uh, how does the quality factor uh, change when we go underground? Well, between Karlsruhe and, and underground, we see a consistent uh, improvement up to a factor of four uh, in the quality factor for this resonator, factor of two for this one, and a bit less for this one. Um, and then when we go back to Rome, so this is the, the arrows show the chronological sequence of measurements. Um, when we go back to Rome, the quality factor decreases again, sometimes below the, the Karlsruhe value and actually sometimes above the Karlsruhe value. This, I, we don't really understand why. Um, yeah, so that's the, um, uh, that's the main story. Now, the, the, um, the nice thing to appreciate is that the subtle, let's say a subtle thing to appreciate is that well, with the thorium source, we, we increase the burst rate um, above ground level, uh, like above the value that we measure outside the tunnel, but the quality factor only decreased by 20%. So this tells us that not all impacts are the same, right? So we, these impacts are somehow, somehow, somehow um, really saturating our detector, let's call it. Um, so we don't really see everything that's happening. Some impacts are doing more damage outside than the impacts that we managed to recreate uh, in, in the tunnel. Um, but even, even so, with the source, we saw, we saw a clear decrease in the quality factor. So, uh, in conclusion, I think, uh, as we've seen from all the other speakers, uh, high impedance circuits are very interesting in emerging field for quantum information processing, and they, they offer several advantages. From my point of view, I think the enharmonicity, the rich spectra, like, like Vlad was mentioning, and the fact that you can localize the modes, basically you can hide both magnetic and electric fields. Uh, these are quite big advantages if you think of it from a scaling perspective. Um, granular aluminum in particular, I think it's a, it's a promising material. Uh, I certainly like working with it and I will continue to, to work with it. Um, but quasi particles, especially in these disordered materials, um, are, are a big problem. In junction arrays, maybe they go away faster um, and then maybe they are less of a problem. Uh, but in, in these uh, disordered materials where quasi particles can live for seconds, we certainly have to find ways of dealing with them. And I, but I've shown you there is hope, right? Uh, so either on chip or, or by um, shielding radioactive sources, I think we can, uh, we can improve, uh, we, can, we can decrease the generation of quasi-particles quite a lot. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Hi, this is John Martinez. I had a question. When you showed the data with and without aluminum islands, um, it looked like um, the rate went down, but yes. the height, um, it, it was more the rate and not the heights of the pulses, although it's kind of hard to I know. Uh, yeah. Have you, is there a conclusion there or you don't know yet? No, no, I agree. The, we don't see a change in the height, actually. So okay. the, the, if we, these are very broadly distributed, so we see all the heights. And uh, I think what this points out to is the fact that our detector just saturates. Um, it's it's yeah. saturated yeah. by the large events. And then probably when we put the, the phonon traps, the large events become smaller, but they're still way larger than the, than the saturation. So they still saturate our detector. So how much did your the rate go down? I mean, I'm going to guess a factor of 30 or so from looking at those two plots. But did you quantitate it? Uh, no, no. Well, yeah, yeah. So we have, oh, I, I removed the plot because I thought I didn't have time to talk about it. Uh, it's in the paper. So it's in, you can find the plot in this paper for all the resonators. It's, it's a factor of like a, a few. It's not 30. It's a factor of, uh, of like um, so, something like a factor of two to five, something like that. Depending on the feeding factor. Or when I look at your plots, it looks much more than two or five, at least if you count the small ones. Yes, yes. So if you count, so the small ones, uh, those are actually not, uh, on this scale, you cannot appreciate that. But these are not actually impacts, I'm, or at least not in the substrate. We don't know what they are, right? So they could be. Oh, small ones, you don't know. 
who knows what they are, right? So, but they, they, they don't look like the big ones because the big ones are really a one pixel drop, right? Like, like you could see it here. Right? So there's, there's just like very quickly, there's no, there's no, basically there's no rising time. Uh, whereas these other ones that we we did not single out with a with a cross here, uh, if you look at them, you can see that you know the rise time is is more abrupt than the relaxation, but you can clearly see a rise time in the relaxation. So this could be impacting the sub in the holder itself actually, in the sample holder, which okay. then propagate through the substrate. So there's two kind of events, small and and fast ones. Okay, good. Maybe I, I think I think the honest answer is that. There's a lot that we don't know about this system, <laughs> so okay. we are we are just like uncovering a bit the the various the various phenomena. Yeah, so so uh, my students trying to uh, look at this too, and and it's nice because we're all getting complimentary information that we can you know put that together. So thanks. Oh, that's great. I, I would be very interested to you know to if when if they have some uh, results, I'd be very interested to. <laughs> to, to things that are complementary to kind of help everyone in the field figure out what's yeah. going on. Yeah, but, sure. Well, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so we have to switch to the discussion session. We are running out of time. 